Well, I interviewed you on the phone back in 2010. Oh, it was around the time that you. growing, yeah, to re meet you finally in person. I don't know if you remember this. It was around the time that um, Growing Up Twisted was coming out, a different reality show you were on. Yes. And I asked you then, it was right around the time that Simon Cowell was leaving American Idol, and everyone was speculating who might be the next judge to take his place. And I remember asking you if you would do it, and you said yes in a hot second. Yeah. Did they ever approach you? No, I, I've <laughs> not been approached, and I've kind of been waiting for the judge seat somewhere. I thought I'd be a great choice. I guess I'm just not, you know, I just, I'm, I'm not TV, you know, <laughs> I don't have the TV look, That's traditional TV look. Uh, but Top Golf decided to, yeah. uh, that I might be just the guy for the job. Exactly. And brought me in for Who Will Rock You. So tell me a little bit about this show, because there was, I love all these reality shows. I think it's great that they give artists a chance. And they haven't applied it to the rock format too much, except for a show on Fox called The Next Great American Band that I was a fan of. But the whole, like, Battle of the Bands format, we haven't really seen. And so I think this show is important. It's sort of keeping... You know, that end of the talent spectrum a lot. Yeah. I mean, when they call me, I, you know, I, I thought it was going to be, you know, another voice, American Idol, whatever, you know, singers competing. And they said, no, 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 we're doing like a battle of the bands. And that lit me up because nobody starts out as just a singer. You don't. Even the soloists that are out there, they were, they had a band. Right. And, you know, and when I was in school, battle of the bands was, was, was the showdown. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think it's really going back to the roots of that kind of competition. And I love the idea of being able to. Well, I don't want to say I, I love the idea because it, it really I'm torn judging because I was them, you know, and they look at me with that face. They look at me with those puppy dog eyes. <laughs> D, you were, you were there, you know, and I've got to say, yeah, but you know, you're not good enough, and you are. So it's, it's part of being the judge. But also, I mean, it's part, people need to know where they can improve. See, I don't view it as the end of the line for any of those bands. If they don't win, I know if they're like me, that means nothing. <laughs> it means they just didn't win this one. Uh -huh. I'm still going at it. And maybe they got something from me and Carrie in the show that'll improve them, sharpen their, their skills, and take them the next step. So you are not the Simon Cowell of the show. You're not mean. Kind of am. <laughs> I kind of, but I'm not. No, I'm not mean though. Okay. I, I'm more funny. He's not funny, and 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 I. But I, you know, like they said, uh, D. Uh, you know, got any got any recommendation? Anything to tell the artists before they start? I said, yeah, don't suck. You know, good advice. You good, don't suck. <laughs> you know, and um, and you know, and people laugh, but it really comes down to that. I mean, uh, one. I, how many, I'm, I gotta look off, how many episodes are we in now? Hold on, I get confused. Well, whatever. But I won't say who, but, but somebody forgets the words to their own song. That's pretty To bad. their own original song. Yeah, that's bad. Now it was like, you can't do that. <laughs> yeah. You can't forget the words to your own song. You can't forget words, period. Yeah. Or to your own song. That said, I did once forget the words, so we're not gonna take it. But I hadn't played it in five years, and um, the audience didn't know the words either. I stopped the song. I, I said, does anybody know what the first verse is? And everybody was just kind of looking around at each other. I said, great. I stopped the song. You didn't even know the words. But, um, but, but you weren't competing. Yeah, I wasn't competing. Yeah, you, you got to be on your game. Well, you've, uh, you've talked about how you were once in their shoes, so you have this sort of empathy for them. But you've played for some tough crowds, and I want to talk a little bit about your oh, early days. I've played for some tough crowds. I'm talking about the early days. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about that, because uh, surely you learned from that experience advice you could give to the bands of today. So like, from what I understand, like in the early days, you were pretty much playing either biker bars, well, for the most part dressed in drag, Yes. or you were playing disco clubs while playing yes. music that was definitely not disco. Not disco. So tell me about some of the rough gigs you played back then. Well, in those days, I was front man and security. You know, I was, <laughs> you know, off the stage multiple times during the night, getting into shoving matches and, and, and dusts up, dust ups, as they say in England, with people in the audience because, uh, well, they weren't approving of us. And I wasn't about to have my, them tell me what I could or could not do. Uh, but it also showed a belief and commitment and that we stood literally stood behind what we were about and while there were those who were offended by it and left the club just slandering us others 
a smaller amount, just loved it. And they came back with their friends. You know what I mean? It's just a band with that kind of commitment and that kind of cojones, you know? So, yeah, they, they were, it was it was rough to walk out in those clubs and the things <laughs> I would wear. Uh -huh. And my wife, when she started making me costumes, she was my girlfriend then, um, they were insanely feminine. Mm -hmm. um, and and if she made it, I wore it. <laughs> I remember Eddie O'J to my guitar player saying, aren't you embarrassed? And I said, no, Suzette made it, I'm wearing it, you know? And uh, so a little shorty, I remember this one top was yellow satin trimmed with purple sequins and a purple feather boa with sleeves to match. It was fantastic. And I uh, walked out there with my, uh, did I give that away? I, had a, I have a box that I throw the costumes mm -hmm. in as time goes on. And it's kind of like sediment. <laughs> and there was this time where the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame wanted to uh, wanted my Stay Hungry outfit for a display on heavy metal. So I had my kids gathered around, and we're going through the box, and I'm pulling through the layers. And as we go down through history, you know, 1985, 84, <laughs> 79, 78, and now there's literally women's clothing in the box. So when you went out, you said you in the purple outfit? Yes, but that was, this was, I'm talking about stuff I bought off the rack. Mm. And my eight, then eight-year-old son looking in the box goes, Dad, did you used to be a transsexual? <laughs> and I said with great pride, son, no, I was a transvestite. If I was a transsexual, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> so, <laughs> true story. <laughs> so did you, yeah, it's interesting. You know, you were this dude wearing the outfit Suzette made for you. Tell me about some of the reactions you would get when you would go out there. Well, I mean, you know, put it this way. People were less than pleased, especially in you know some of the biker clubs mm -hmm. and the more down and dirty clubs. I mean, I'm, I've had some, you know, there's been some fights and straight razors put to my throat and crazy stuff that's happened over those early years, you know. Um, but you have to fight back, you know. What I mean, it's it's you know, fight for your right to party, right? No, but I, I, you know, I would, and and I learned that the audience. This is one of the things I try to impart to people. The audience, well, first of all, I, okay. First of all, no audience ever went to a show hoping the band will suck. That's true. You have this, that window, that moment. People go to a show hoping the comedian will be good, hoping the band will be good. They're not hoping you'll suck. So you got to be able to grab that hope. And if you blow it, though, they will turn on you like a Doberman. <laughs> I mean, it's just, and you, so you got to be ready to stand your ground and push back when they push, you know? So I got really good at pushing back and, uh, you know, and, and, long, and pushing back long enough for people to take a look and say, well, you know what? Or listen, I should say, this band's pretty cool, you know, once you get past the way they look. As a matter of fact, I, the only song I ever wrote for a lighting plot was our longtime opener, What You Don't Know Sure Can Hurt You, which was entirely in silhouette mm -hmm. for the first half of the song. So we would come out on stage and we would just be rocking in silhouette. People going, hey, these guys are kind of good. Hey, this is really rocking. Oh my God. And then the lights would come on. So oh, they turned all sorts of Sam Kinison. Ow, oh, ow, oh, ow. Oh. So um, yeah, so yeah, we, that was our opening song for a very long time. What inspired that aesthetic, uh, the early aesthetic and the aesthetic you had later, which was a little more macho, but still very flamboyant. Yes, flamboyant's a good word. Um, it was <clears throat> it was early 70s glitter and glam, New York mm -hmm. Dolls, right. Alice Cooper, David Bowie. You know, we uh, I joined in 76, Twisted Sister, who had formed in 73 as a wannabe New York Dolls. Mm. And um, by 76, they were kind of thinking about changing things, even the name. But I came in this rube from the suburbs who was still enamored with that whole glittery look. And I was like, no, 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 let's still do this. I love the, the fantasticness of it. You know, you, 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 you came looking from an outer, you were outer worldly, otherworldly. You came out on stage and the audience would just go, what the, you know, is that? Mm -hmm. You know, so, and I love that response. Do you look for that in the bands that you judge on this show? Or are you, are you looking at like how they're, they're dressed? Do you want them to come out in more than T-shirt and jeans? Well, you know, while I certainly enjoy a band that, that brings a full show, it all relates to the band itself. You know, for, you know, if, if you're, a, you know, a, a, a country act, you know, and we have some country rock uh, acts on there, it, it wouldn't be right for you to be dressed in, you know, kiss makeup, you know, or maybe <laughs> it would. I don't cool. know. It would be kind of weird. It would be, cool. be kind of cool. Yeah. But, um, 
you know, so I kind of judge it by like, what are you going for? Yeah, my wife always says, you know, be the best thing you that you can be. She says she does makeup and costumes and stuff. And mm -hmm. she said, when I work with people, I said, what do you want to be? And then I try to help them become the best at that. So are they the best at what they're trying to do? That's what I look for. Not that they look like Twisted Sister, for sure. Well, you once sang, and you still sing, uh, You Can't Stop Rock and Roll. It's yes. interesting in, you know, today's day and age, uh, there's been a lot of sort of, you know, kind of hand wringing about like the state of rock, it not being um, as popular, at least on the charts, that it once was. And, but there's still these young bands that want to do it. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, people. I've gotten <laughs> to do some pretty, you know, uh, with pretty like social media arguments with people. These older people, and I'm not including myself because I'm not letting myself get into that mental state. Yeah. They're just not looking anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, um, bands aren't getting the attention they once got. They weren't, there isn't that massive MTV or national radio uh, connection anymore. And, but it's more target marketed. It's, you know, it's on social media. But I, my kids are into metal and they've been taking me out to shows for years. And I've seen passionate, great bands with passionate audience, packed houses and clubs and little theaters, and when I go to the Van Warp tour, big audiences singing every word. Mm -hmm. And the bands themselves, they've got nothing to lose. They, I've spoken with these guys. They don't think they'll become rich doing this. They're hoping maybe to pay the bills, but they've got to do it because they want to rock. It's still <laughs> there. They can't not do it. It doesn't matter if it pays or it doesn't pay. And I remember feeling that way when I started out. So when people say, oh, there's no good music, you know, Gene Simmons famously did an article in GQ. You know, there's no more Dylans, there's no more Hendrix, you know, don't bother picking up a guitar. That's crap. There's some really talented young people. They're just not getting a light shined on them anymore, but they have an audience. It's, it's a very, you know, it's very inside. Their people know when they're gonna be around. Unfortunately, the, there's no rock stars anymore. That's it's, what we lost. Yeah, well, it could happen again, though. Do you think it could happen again? Yeah, on a mainstream level, I mean. It's, still ha it's happening in the clubs. Yeah, I try to analyze the rock star thing, and I think there's a certain ubiquitousness that's required. You look it up, people. U-B-I-Q-U. -U. <laughs> um, uh, but just that there was a time where you, in the 70s and 80s, 60s, you were on TV, you were on the billboards, you were, you know, you were on the radio, you were everywhere. In the stores, there was a present, there was posters, there were record stores, there were, you know. So people who didn't even like the band or follow the band were aware that you existed. Right. And that lent itself to the rock star persona to see that billboard on the Sunset Strip. I just uh, did an interview for a documentary about that. About That's gone now, really. Was and it the MTV documentary? No, this is an in, independent, uh, independent one that's being oh, okay. put together based on the book mm. and on the, on the billboards of the Sunset Strip. But it, it was just this awareness. Like you didn't know who the doors were, maybe, but I saw that billboard. Yeah. You know who Alice Cooper was, but I saw that billboard with the snake wrapped around his groin. He was nude. You know, And so it was a different time. Now, like I said, everything's target marketing. So only the people interested in your sound even know you exist. Mm, yeah. Well, we mentioned a little bit of MTV, and you mentioned we're not going to take it. So I just realized that this month, May, is the 35th anniversary yeah. of the release of We're Not Going to Take It. It's still a song that to this day is very prevalent in pop culture, but um, obviously was a song that broke you guys through on MTV in a really big way. And uh, I just want to talk a little bit about that song. What inspired you to write it? Um, the usual, my dad, my ex-bosses, my teachers, <laughs> ex-girlfriends, my peers, you know, all the stuff I was mad at in the world. And, um, <laughs> you know, and, and I wanted to write an anthem for everybody. And, you know, so, so I think it was the Village Voice smugly reviewed the song, What From Whom? Two words. That was the whole review? That was the review. What From Whom? You know, uh, meantime. Oh, we're not going to take what from whom. Yes, okay. what from whom. Right. And a great song, and I mean, this isn't always the case, but it usually isn't super specific about the what and the who. Unless you're talking smoke on the water, and then for some reason they go down to actually who pulled the bodies out of the fire <laughs> in Lake Geneva when they were opening up for Frank Zappa. It's a bizarre song. But mostly you try to keep it general enough that people read their situation. And that's why 
you know, decades later, you'll hear it at a teacher's rally. You'll see it here at a sporting event. It was in Steven Spielberg's, you know, uh, Ready Player One as the big finale song. It'll, it'll pop up. It'll be in there for Yaz, uh, women's, <laughs> yeah, there's some sort of women's, Premenopausal thing was it? Yes, was a birth control. Birth control. Yes, yeah. we're not going to take. We're not going to take it. Control? Yes, I'm doing God's work. Don't you judge me. <laughs> um, I had two kids in college at that point. I needed some. I needed some tuition money. Um, but anyway, you know. But you you read your situation into the song. That makes a great song. So what from home? Yeah. As small games, clever as it was, it was the point. And I think that's why the song has longevity because I didn't sing, I'm not taking it from my father mm. or I'm not taking it from my teachers. It was, we're not taking it, period. Well, you have mentioned that's been used in a lot of everything from birth control ads to movies. So, of course, I have to ask you about, it was a few years ago, but when Donald Trump used it and then at first you said yes and then, and then you nicely asked him not to use it, what happened there? Well, yes, okay. So I did Celebrity Apprentice for like three seasons. First season I was on like finale, then I was on the second season after that, and then I was on the All-Stars. So, you know, you work with people and you get to know people and we became friendly, the Trump family. And, you know, um, look, there's three rules of socialization. Don't talk about religion, politics, or sports. Sports, and, okay. Yeah, that's the three. Okay. And look, I got uh, one of my best friends he wears, I'm not going to say which hats we wear because we don't talk about it, okay. but he wears the hat of a team that the hat I wear, and we hate each other. And as long as I've known him, we've never mentioned our hats because <laughs> it probably will be the end of our relationship. <laughs> and he's one of my closest friends. Okay. Okay, so it's just like, don't talk about those things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we socialized, we did charity work together, uh, stuff for St. Jude's, uh, you know, we did, and so we became friendly. When he started to run, and I remember Penn Jillette called me going, hey, Trump's running again. He goes, there's no season of Celebrity Apprentice on. I think he may be serious. <laughs> that was what Penn's call to me was. Because usually it was just sort of like to pump up the attention to Celebrity Apprentice. Right. So um, he said, Can I, I'd love to use the song. And I said, yeah, sure, man. You know, I think he's going to raise some hell for sure. And he did. Um, cut to a few months later and... Um, I just could not stand with the things he was saying. There were so many things I couldn't stand with, and it just got to a point where I just said, uh, yeah, you know, the big one was the immigration thing. That was like the, that was the breaking point because my grandfather received political asylum mm. in this country, and if he was not given political asylum, I wouldn't be here. So how could I just insult his memory by like standing with someone who's so hard against that, mm. you know? And uh, so, but you know, so my kids would go, well, you gotta go to the, because my kids are, you know, Bernie, Bernie, Bernie. <laughs> and they're like, you gotta go to the press. Yeah, I said, look, he asked me as a gentleman, which people don't usually do. Paul Ryan just started using it. Mm. Other people just start using it and you gotta sort of say, hey, I object. Um, and uh, so I, I said, I'm gonna give him the consideration of a calling and saying, I'd like you to stop. And I called him. And he said, okay. And that night, he stopped okay. and never used it again. So, I mean, what it, for what it's worth, I mean, you know, at least there was that, you know. And, uh, and then I remember calling him and saying, so, were you cool? You know? And he goes, hey, man, we did a lot of charity work together. And we have. We've raised a lot of money to help people through charity. And we've got that connection, you know. So, do I think we'll be doing more charity work together? No, I don't. Uh, but the point is, you know, we just left it at that. Are you still friends with him? I haven't spoken to him since then. You know, yeah. I mean, it's just, I, you know, it's hard when you find out someone's position is so far to, the, well, in this case, the right of where you stand. Uh, you know, I mean, it's funny because, you know, uh, Vice called me a gun-carrying woman's, uh, um, a, a gun-carrying uh, woman's rights activist because I'm, I'm pro every amendment. I fought for the first I'm a concealed carrier. Not here, everybody. Relax. Uh, you know, and I believe in that right as well. Of course, intelligently, we can make some adjustments. I'm not NRA material. Okay. I don't have a blind sort of like, everything's go grenades. We need those. No, <laughs> yeah. we don't need grenades. Mm -hmm. But the point is, I, you know, I fight for all the amendments, and, and I believe in them. I believe in this country. So it's a lot that he does not stand with, and, uh, and I don't stand with him. 
All right. Did you? I know that he sometimes can get a little resentful about people not voting for him, and I believe you did say you were planning to vote for Hillary. Do you? Of course, I did. Okay. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, which was the mistake. Of course, no, I did not think. Um, I, look, he never served in any kind of office ever, and that's very evident. <laughs> it's very evident. There's no understanding of the. It's impressive that the first thing he runs for is president of the United States, and he wins on one level. Uh, but on another level, he's got no, it wasn't like, you know, Reagan or Schwarzenegger or, or, or any of these other, you know, any other of these people who were actors or, or something and went into politics where they started at a lower level and worked their way up. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, I need someone, I needed, wanted someone in the office who had some idea of what was going on. I just wonder if he was upset about that because, you know. I don't know, I'm sure he was. Well, uh, I'm wondering if you would ever go into politics yourself, because like you were really, you're well spoken here. You have, you're, you're steadfast in your beliefs. You're a man of the people. You were very well spoken at the PM, PMRC hearings. Thank you. Uh, almost. I'm uh, really glad you brought this up because I'm announcing I am the 25th <laughs> candidate, Democratic candidate. <laughs> Snyder 2020. 2020. Do we have enough? <laughs> Absolutely not. No. I have brushed, had brushes with politics. It is such a disgusting business. A decent person can't function. And I consider myself to be a decent person. Uh, and I'm not, you know, trashing some of the people who have tried to do good work. But you've got to get into the muck and mire. You've got to get in the swamp. And you look at, the, you saw Lincoln. And he saw the back room deals that were going on to free the slaves. What he, the things he did were not cool. A lot of those things he did were really, if you if you watch the movie and you know, assuming it's politically accurate, there were some things that you know he took some uh, some liberties with the law in order for the greater good. I just can't function that way, oh, you know. I would vote for you. Yeah, I, I vote. Thank you. I, I and I said I want to rock, not I want to run. So. <laughs> I would ask, though, since you did ask Trump and Ryan actually not to use, we're not going to take it. Are there any of these many, many candidates running for 2020 that if they asked you to use the song, you'd be like, yeah, you can use it? I tell people, this is, just, this is a simple litmus test here. Are you pro-choice? And by pro-choice, I mean all choices. I mean pro-people's rights to choose particularly a woman's right to choose. I feel very strongly, and that is a litmus test. If you say you are not, if you say, you know, and, and, and I hate the whole concept of pro-choice, you know, versus, well, they, they say, I call it no choice. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like, you know, you choose for yourself, you know, and that means you can have children, you can all, you don't have children. They're like, no, we're deciding for you what is right for you. So if you, I, I say nothing, if to anybody who stands for, is pro-choice and has at least that position, knock yourself out. Republican, Democrat, and there, and there are Republicans out there, there are. who are. They call them, you know, Northeastern uh, Republicans as a rule, tend to be fiscally conservative, socially liberal. Mm -hmm. I, love, I love those guys, you know. So, yeah, I mean, so, you know, if you're, if you're pro-choice, yeah, go for it. Since you bring that up, I got to ask you all the stuff going on this week, like literally this week with Alabama, Georgia, it looks like Missouri now. Like, is this weighing heavily on you? It only weighs heavily on me. Like, my days dealing with that are numbered. But, I, you know, I'm not numbered. I, they are numbered. But, but, I mean, I don't have to deal with that. I'm beyond it. Uh, I had my, you know, I had my... My best deference snipped, so there's no chance of I have no concern about that. Uh, I've got medical care. I don't need you know I don't need Planned Parenthood. But there was a time when I did, mm -hmm. when I was a kid, and I didn't have any of those things, and it upsets me that that this is being taken away from people as an option because it's not just about terminating pregnancies. The majority of what Planned Parenthood does, an organization like that, is give people guidance. And information, and you know, and so it's it's just such a much bigger picture, and it drives me crazy. But it, mainly for my children and my I have grandchildren now, mm -hmm. and I think about the world that they're growing up in, and it's mm -hmm. it's it's a mess. It is. Well, I'm going to end things on a happy note. If you got time, my favorite yes. movie of all time is Pee Wee Herman's Big Adventure. It is literally my favorite movie of all time. This speaks volumes about this woman. <laughs> 
Volumes. Okay. Probably. So, so please tell me about how you got involved. Touch in greatness. That. I was there. You were uh, on the hood of the car. Oh, I know. She's touching greatness. Uh, okay. Um, how to get involved? Well, Pee Wee, before he was a children's entertainer, was a main, not mainstream, but he was just a comedian mm -hmm. out there on the circuit. Um, doing comedy specials, mostly college age audience, playing to that kind of crowd, and hit a little bit of edgier act, and I was a big fan. So we ran into each other at the 8045 MTV New Year's party, and he was appearing. We were back in the green room, and it was sort of like, hey, dude, I love what you do. And he's like, dude, I love what you do. Like, ah, you know, ah, you know, mutual admiration. So he calls me a few months after that and says, hey, man, I'm making a movie. Uh, what do you think about doing a cameo in it? And we happened to be in L.A., it just worked out, we were uh, doing five sold-out nights at the Long Beach Arena with Iron Maiden, it was amazing. Okay. And they were filming at Warner Brothers' back lot, and so we're like, yeah, cool. So it was great to go down there. And the thing I remember most, besides, it got me into screenplay writing, because seeing Insanity brought to life made me say, I want to do this. I had written the Twisted videos, but it was really like, so this dad comes into the room, he's yelling <laughs> at the kid, and the kid turns it, that's me writing it, you know? Yeah, okay. But this was like, I gotta learn how to write screenplays, because mm. I love seeing insanity brought to life. But I remember on the set, there was a guy dressed exactly like Pee Wee, Paul. And I said, hey, Paul, what, who's that? He goes, oh, that's the director, Tim. Uh, and it was, and he, I said, Tim, he said, Tim Burton, he, he did Frank and Weenie? I'm like, Oh, yeah, I saw that movie. It was pretty cool. So, you know, Tim Burton's Tim Burton. But uh, that day, he was dressed just like Pee Wee Herman, <laughs> but with a little, like, curly hair. Amazing. Yes. It was an iconic scene. Iconic scene. And I, for a while there, it was, like, the thing I was known best for, oddly. Went through a period where, that's the guy from Pee Wee Herman. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> Is this going to be my legacy? But fortunately, just part of it. Yes, just part of it. Just part a of proud it. part of it. <laughs> as, as long as it didn't stick <laughs> and become my only thing. Well, thank you for sharing that story with me. And thank you for so much for coming here and giving me such a great interview. It was an honor. Pleasure.